in an elders meeting with Craig and John and Gary this past week at Cancun's, we got to talking about how our church can help people live better as disciples of Christ. And in the midst of that conversation, Craig noted how part of the problem with Christians today is that we're too busy with all these other things. I mean, we're distracted by our kids and their sports or our hobbies or their hobbies. We're, we're distracted by Facebook and Instagram, by TV and the Internet, by our work and our leisure time activities. I mean, you name it. And usually what takes a back seat to everything else going on in our lives is God and his church. Craig observed that for far too many people, Church is something they go to and participate in if they don't have anything else to do. Uh, you know, that, and, and so they schedule their lives around all this other stuff going on when really we should be scheduling our lives around Christ and the church as a priority. And I think he makes a good point. You know, we, he got us to thinking. And this becomes a question of, do you really believe that God is to take first place in your heart and in your life. With what or whom do you identify the most? Now for the Christian, Jesus is to be at the core of, of who we are and all that we are. We are to find our identity in him, not in our social status or in our sexuality or in the car we drive or in the house that we live in or the clothes we wear or the job we work or the bank account, how thick it is. And it affects everything else we do when you identify yourself in Jesus. It affects the attitudes with which we live. It affects how we treat other people and how we talk to them. Identifying ourselves with Jesus impacts how we spend our time and on what we spend our money. But based on our actual actions, maybe we don't really believe what we say we do when it comes to identifying ourselves with Jesus. I'll tell you what I think could correct this whole dilemma and bring more balance into our life. Instead of looking at what everybody else is doing or not doing, instead of looking to Success Magazine to see how you should prioritize your life, instead of looking to the computer or the TV ads for you know, who you should be and what you should look like, maybe it's time we get back to the basics of finding our identity in Jesus. And that is what this whole message series is about, getting back to the basics. Have you ever noticed how people are always trying to figure out who they are? It's not just people like Bruce Jenner trying to figure out who he is and then landing on the name Caitlin. Who am I? Is one of the most important and most asked questions in each person's life. We all want to know who we are. How many of you are on Facebook? How many of you are? Okay, a lot of you are on Facebook. <clears throat> I'm friends with a number of you, I know. Uh, no doubt you've seen those little identity quizzes. I think it's put out by like nametest.com or something like that. But uh, do you know the ones I'm talking about? There must be hundreds of different ones of these, I call them identity quizzes. They're the ones that go something like this. Here's, here's one example. What Disney character are you? You know what I'm talking about? And then based on the input you put in, they identify you as one of the Disney characters. Tyler is goofy. <laughs> I don't know if I think that's a compliment, but there's all kinds of these identity quizzes. What candy bar are you? What movie star are you? What footwear matches your personality? Which word defines your life? What fast food are you? What division of the army would you serve in? What nickname fits you 100%? What color are you? What animal are you? I like to think of myself as a tiger. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's the truth. And then the one that really cracks me up, though, is are you a perfect couple? You know, and I have yet to see any, any answer come back to that, are you the perfect couple? that is anything other than, yes, you two are 110% the perfect couple. I mean, can you imagine the problem if that got put all over Facebook? No, you are not the perfect couple. You know, you should be with this other person or something. I think the reason why these kinds of things exist is we all have this deep-seated need to find out who we are. When we were kids, 
we had a fantasy, right, that we were some long lost prince or princess from a faraway land, and one day we'd be found and we'd be made into royalty. You remember the movie The Princess Diaries, starring Anne Hathaway and Julie Andrews? The teenager Mia Thermopolis discovers that she's the heir to the throne of the kingdom of Genovia, and it's ruled by her grandmother Clarice Rinaldi. I confess, even though Ariel's the one that introduced me to that movie, I love it. <laughs> I'm a sucker for happy endings. <laughs> But the reason why we're talking about identity today is because way too many of us go through life and we don't like the answer to the que our, that question, who am I? We don't like our answer for that. Or maybe we're not even sure who we are. But knowing who you are is a game changer in life and that it will give you confidence and stability in your life if you identify yourself correctly and accurately instead of by what everybody else is labeling you as. And what scripture teaches us is that we are to identify ourselves with Jesus. And out of all the voices trying to tell you who you are or who you should be or what you need to change, guess what? God's voice is the one that counts the most. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. God's voice is the one that counts the most. People don't determine your identity. God does. Your identity has been given to you by him. It starts right in the very beginning of the Bible's message, all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make humans in our image, in our likeness. I like how the New Living Translation puts it. It says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. That's a powerful statement about who you are. And it also means that God has insight into how you tick. And the Bible's message reveals to us who we really are. Your identity is grounded upon Jesus, not on anything else. Now, as powerful a statement as that Genesis verse is, there is an even more specific scripture that identifies who you are when you are a follower of Christ. And that is in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, How great is the love of the Father that he has lavished on us that we should be called children of God, for that is what we are. Don't you just love that? I mean, that is, that is a powerful, powerful verse. When it comes to having a healthy self-identity, the Bible points out four factors that give us a proper and powerful perspective about who we are as the people of God. And I want us to look at those right now. The first factor that helps us know who we are is this. I know that I am loved. As we read through the Bible, we see that God goes to such great lengths to make clear how much he loves you. And knowing that you are loved by God, it identifies you as someone who's very special. Early on in the New Testament Gospel of John, we read of the time when Jesus was explaining his purpose as the Savior to a guy named Nicodemus. And in John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read Jesus' words. <clears throat> he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting, Everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the definitive declaration that you and I are loved, loved so incredibly by God that he would sacrifice his own life so that we could be with him forever. Now in the world that we live in, I don't know of a more astounding declaration of love from one human being to another than that someone would give up their life for another person. And yet, Jesus did that for you. We read in John 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Because we know this so well in relation to Jesus, I think sometimes we just kind of gloss over it. We just, yeah, I know that already, right? But Jesus did this for you, and we need to remember that. You are loved. And really, we need to stop trying to convince ourselves that we are lovable and special, you know, our, our culture is so narcissistic and self-absorbed and uh, we got to have these warm fuzzies or we just don't feel good in life. But you know, the fact of the matter is we're not all that lovable. 
<laughs> we just aren't. Uh, listen, I'm not lovable. Ask my family. <laughs> I'm not lovable. But here's the thing. I don't identify myself by my lovability. Instead, I rest in the glorious fact that I am loved. And you know something? You're not lovable either. No offense. But know this. You are loved. You are loved by God. You are loved by this church. Here's a second factor that gives us a proper and powerful perspective about who we are as the people of God. Number two, I am significant. Most of us look for and find our fleeting significance and how much we do or how busy we are or how many people depend on you or what you have. We find our significance in our status, you know, that we've reached or the titles that are attached to our name. Our constant striving and pushing and clamoring for significance, though, it usually ends in one place. Confusion, stressed out, exhaustion, disillusionment. Jesus has the answer to that kind of living. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, we read of the time when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now understand. Jesus isn't saying that we should be lazy. He isn't saying that we shouldn't follow through with our responsibilities. What he is saying is that we must not find our identity in our work or accomplishments, but we must find our identity in our relationship with him. When you take on Jesus' yoke, when you take on his burden, you are identified as belonging to him, and that makes you significant. Ephesians 2.10 puts it like this. We are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Your significance comes from the fact that you are God's masterpiece. You are God's workmanship. A lot of people live stressed out lives, always clamoring for the next best, newest thing that comes along. Because they're looking for their significance in accomplishments and achievements. And that's completely backwards from what God says. God says your significance comes from the fact that you are his workmanship. You are his masterpiece. I hope that you'll believe that this morning. And again, yes, there is stuff for you to do here, but that stuff can't be the foundation of your significance. That ties into a third factor that gives us a proper and powerful perspective about who we are as people of God. I have purpose. You have purpose. So what is the purpose of a Christian? What are the people of God purposed to do? What are we supposed to do? I like the motto of our church that has been our church's motto for over 20 years now. Does anybody know the motto of Community Christian Church? Working together to win together. Good job. You saw it, didn't you? <laughs> Working together to win together. You know what that means? It means that we love God by working hand in hand with him and his purposes and by winning people to him so that they can love him too. It also means that we love people by giving them a hand up in life. We reach out to them. We help people become better husbands and wives, better parents and children, better employees and employers, better uh, citizens of our communities and our nation. That's what we mean by working together to win together. In other words, as a church, God has given us a purpose. As God's people, as followers of Jesus, we must be about his business, fulfilling his purposes. And in Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 31, we read about that. Jesus says the most important commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. You and I have the most important purpose on earth, loving the one who created you and sharing God's love with other people. Your job is to put those two purposes into action in your life. You have to figure out how every day you can love God and love people. 
And nothing feels better than living in connection with who you are as the person that God made you to be in his image. Here's the fourth factor that gives you a proper and powerful perspective about who you are as a person of God. A fourth factor that will help you to have a healthy self-identity because it is tied into Jesus, and that is, I belong. You know, there's something heart-wrenching about loneliness, isn't there? I mean, we need companions. We need friends on this journey through life. We need to belong. And we've all encountered loneliness at one point or another to varying degrees. When I was in my early teens, I had friends and I kept busy, but still something was missing in my life. As a member of the high school band, I had artistic talent. I, I was part of the swim team, but something was still missing out of my life. And it led to loneliness. To the point where I would be drawn into and sucked into whoever would give me their attention and time. It led to some poor choices. It led to some poor decisions. But thank God, it also caused me to do some deep soul searching. And when a friend, when a friend invited me to his church where the Bible's message was preached and taught, it ignited my spirit, and I didn't feel so lonely anymore. In fact, I was part of a church family who accepted me as I was, and they loved me. And as I think back to those early days of my involvement in the church, I think, whew, that's pretty rough along the edges, <laughs> you know, around the edges in the way I talked. I was pretty rough around the edges in the way uh, I, I behaved, some of the habits that I had. But they accepted me. And I knew that at First Church of Christ in Owasso, I belonged. God is all about community, and he's all about fellowship and companionship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul describes the church as a human body, where every part is related to the other part as they work together under the head. Who is the head of the body, as Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 12? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the head. Every part belongs, and if one part is missing, guess what? It affects the rest, and not in a good way, because there's a piece of the body missing. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Paul summarizes this passage with these words. He says, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Isn't that an awesome thing to realize about yourself? You belong. All of you belong to this community, the way that your arm or your leg belongs to your body. This is why we have life groups and youth group and children's ministry and nursery and the praise team and the, the facilities and grounds team and various Bible study groups and all sorts of things because we have a need to be a part of a community. And the church is an important way to find belonging. And guess what? Because you belong to the church. You will, at the end of your life, belong to heaven. That's why Paul could say this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells Christians, he says, you belong to the family of God. You belong to the church. You belong to Jesus in heaven. But you know, even though the Bible tells us we are loved, we are significant, we have purpose, we belong, I know that we don't always feel that way. I know we don't. We don't always feel like God loves us, whether it's in the toughest of trials or the quietest of times. We don't always feel like we have significance, maybe in this world or even to God, because it's easy to feel small and ignored. We oftentimes struggle to know our, our purpose or to feel like we belong to anything. If that's you this morning, I want you to know you're in good company. We all wonder about our identity from time to time, but listen carefully right now. Listen carefully. There's a very good reason why this message series isn't called Feel. This message series is called Believe. And when you believe in something, it means you have great confidence or faith in certain truths. These truths are reliable, and you believe in them whether or not you feel it. Listen, this is very important. Your identity in Jesus doesn't rely on your feelings. Your identity in Jesus is a core truth and belief that you can 
rely on no matter what you're going through in life, no matter what feelings you have, no matter what you are feeling like. In that, as we continue to call Jesus Lord and God Father, we are called son and daughter. And as we wrap up this morning, I just want to remind you again of what 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says. Say it with me if you know it. How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us that we should be called what? Children, Children of God. And that is what we are. I love what Randy Frazee says in his book, Think, Act, and Be Like Jesus. He says, the more we know and accept who we are in Christ, the more our behavior will begin to reflect our true identity. He says it will translate into not allowing anyone or anything to devalue who we are in Christ. We'll be set free to use our words for building bridges, not burning them. To use our hands to hug, not hurt. To use our feet to bring in, not take away. To use our hearts to inspire, not conspire. To raise the level of any room that we're in, not bring it down. Randy Frazee says, as we love God and grow deeper in our love for him, we will then, anywhere and everywhere we go, be Jesus with skin on. Isn't that great? When you identify your life in Jesus, you are him with skin. Say that with me. Him with skin. Let's be that. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, you've done a wonderful thing for us through Jesus Christ. And your love is amazing. We know that we are something not because of our own actions or activity, but because you have loved us. You've created us in your image. And that says something. Thank you for loving us, for making us significant, for giving us a purpose and a place in which we can belong. May it be our strength, our rock, our foundation, understanding who we are in Jesus Christ. I pray that for each person here today. May we go forth with your favor and blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.